Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first ever ReefSco Live lesson. My name is Noelle, and I'm a marine scientist here at the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. Today, you are joining us for a live broadcast from right outside Little Cayman, and you'll be joining us on a dive to explore the complex reef ecosystems and to learn why they matter for us. Before we get started today, let's go around and meet our team. First, we have our boat captain and our cable manager, Lowell. Then we have our project manager, Tom, and our producer, Paul. And now, let's go under the water and meet the rest of our production team. First of all, we have our underwater educator, Katie, who she will be presenting our lesson today. Next, we have Drew, our videographer, on the macro camera lens. And finally, our videographer, Evan, who will be on the main camera. Of course, we have our underwater dive support crew, Celine, Ali, Joe, and Lauren. All right, now that you've met everyone, I'm going to tell you how you can interact with us live while our team gets in place for the live lesson. So as a team, we're going to teach you some very important objectives about the coral reef ecosystem. Please follow along throughout the lesson to see, hear, and ask questions about anything that occurs during the dive. Remember, this is happening live right here in Little Cayman. If you do have a question, please type it into the live chat box to the right of the YouTube screen. I will see your question or your comment, and I will relay it to our underwater educator, Katie, who will answer as soon as she can. You're welcome to ask as many or as few questions as you would like. Don't forget, you have an in-class activity sheet to complete throughout the lesson, so be sure to follow along so that you can complete that worksheet. We'd like you all to think about a few questions before we get started about the lesson, and you can send those in via the live chat if you know them. First, what exactly is a coral? How big are coral reefs? What sort of animals can you find on coral reefs? Where can I find a coral reef? And finally, how can you breathe underwater? So before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Nope? Awesome. So our team should be ready and in place underwater so we can check in with them and see if they're ready for the lesson. Hey, Katie, how's it going down there? Hey, Noelle. I think our team looks like everybody's in place, so we can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. All right, we're all set up here, so take it away. All right, well, hello everybody, and welcome to a coral reef in Lil Cayman. My name is Katie Correa, and I'm a marine scientist at the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. Today, you all are going to be my dive buddies to go on an exploratory dive on this coral reef. As Noel said, if anybody has any questions throughout the dive, feel free to just type them in that chat box to the right, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. All right? For now, why don't we go explore this beautiful coral reef, starting with what is a coral? So come with me, and we'll see if we can find a cool one on this reef. All right, Katie, it sounds like it's going to be an awesome dive. So first, you're going to talk to us about the structure of a coral, I think? Absolutely. As you can see, there's a lot of corals on this reef, but let's start with this one right here. This is a mounding star coral, and there's quite a few of them on the reef. And if you look at them quite closely, you can see that it actually appears quite bumpy. Now, a coral is a very complex marine organism. Many people don't know that it's actually an animal. When you look at this coral up close, each of these little teeny tiny bumps actually houses a tiny anemone-like animal called a polyp. Now, each of those polyps in these coral-like cups, or the little bumps you see, make up the entire colony, or the entire coral animal. Now, they're also very stony and hard to the touch, like a rock, which is what a lot of people think they are. We're not going to touch it because that could actually harm the coral, but if you did, 
you might take away a little a mucus like substance on your fingers and that's because there's actually a tiny algae living inside each of those polyps called zooxanthellae. Those zooxanthellae are taking in energy from the sun and producing about 95% of the nutrients that the entire colony needs to survive. The other 5% of the nutrients comes from those little individual polyps actually reaching out and grabbing food with their tentacles. So, as you can see, a coral is more than what it just looks like. It's an animal, a plant, and a rock. That's really cool, Katie. Thanks for teaching us that. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I think on the student's worksheet, there's something called a brain coral. Do you study any brain corals on the reef around you? Actually, I do. There's one just up here. So we can actually swim up to investigate this brain coral a little bit closer. Now this particular brain coral is called a grooved brain coral because it's got a lot of grooves in it and it looks just like a brain aptly named. You can see just here. Now, this brain coral is pretty large. It's about one and a half by two and a half feet wide at the widest point, but it could be a little wider if it wasn't for the competition on the reef around it. If you look very closely, there's another coral just here, another mountainous star coral, as well as some algae all around it as well. This other species of coral and the algae are all competing with the brain coral for space on the reef. So competition on the reef can be for any number of things. It can be for space on the open limestone reef. It can be for food or also for reproductive purposes. So this particular example shows two different species of coral competing for open space on this coral reef. That's pretty cool. So Paul thinks that he might see an example of competition on the reef just between a coral head and a sponge. Do you see anything like that down there, Katie? Well, Noel, actually, I will look for it in a minute, but it turns out a sea turtle just happens to be swimming right in the frame of our reefs go live. So if you look behind you, there appears to be a green sea turtle kind of coming in to check us out underwater. <laughs> Our videographer Drew, sort of nearing the green turtle as it yeah. came down all the way to investigate us and see what was going on. <laughs> Which is pretty awesome because I think a sea turtle is also one of the animals on the students' in-class activity sheets, along with a brain coral. <laughs> That is pretty cool. That's a really good find. Good job, guys. Yeah, that was a good spot by some of our our safety divers that are down below. So, well job. Good job, team. <laughs> awesome. So, Katie, do we want to maybe go back to looking for an example of competition on the reef? Right. Um, let's see. Actually, we've got one just up here. So, if you guys swim with me over here, we've got a perfect example of a coral competing for space with this sponge. So right here, we've got another smaller boulder star coral with another black or purple vase sponge right here. Now, again, this is similar to the algae and the coral competing for space on the reef because as you can see, there's some areas of bare limestone here and the coral, when their larvae would settle onto this bare limestone. However, the climate change of the ocean environment is more conducive and more likely to grow sponges than corals. So this sponge has been able to overgrow this particular spot on the reef more so than this coral. 
So, good spot to whoever spotted that coral and spun it on the reef. Cool. Thanks, Katie. So, I think we've actually got some questions coming in. So, we'll go through a couple of those if you don't mind answering some of our questions. Absolutely. Okay. So, first of all, um, Takira from Edna Moyle Primary School wants to know how you're able to talk underwater. <laughs> That's a great question, and I'll tell you, not very easily. <laughs> you see, um, this mask on my face is attached to this hose. This hose is going to the scuba tank on my back so that I'm able to breathe, first of all. Also inside this mask is a series of microphones that are touching my lips pretty much. And those are attached to this cable, which is floating up behind me, so that I'm able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Noel on the boat and with you guys in your classroom. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Thanks, Katie. So next, uh, let's see. We've got some other questions coming in. Um, some year six students want to know if coral can be poisonous to fish. If coral can be poisonous to fish? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, there's not a lot of coral here in the Caribbean which can be poisonous to fish. However, our reefs are quite young, whereas the Pacific Ocean has a lot more corals and a lot more fishes as well. And some of those corals have evolved what are called poisonous nematocysts. Now, all cnidarians, so anemones and jellyfish and corals, they all have these nematocysts or stinging cells. And it's actually a small cell that has a little harpoon-like, almost like extremity or arm that it shoots out to sting you. However, the corals on our reefs either lack the nematocysts or they don't harm humans or fishes. So here, I don't think there's any coral that are poisonous to fishes. In the Pacific reefs, there very well could be some very toxic corals out there. Good answer, Katie. So one more question. Uh, Cyan from Red Bay Primary School wants to know, when corals are fighting for space, do they end up harming each other at all? That's actually a great question. Was that Brian or Ryan? Cyan with a T. Oh. <laughs> so, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know if we can see any examples of it here on our reef. Oh, actually our videographer Drew's got some over here. When corals fight against each other for space, they can actually harm each other. Now they have these little arms almost that at night, when corals have all of their polyps extended for feeding, they can actually reach out and fight against one another as well for space or for food or for reproduction. So when you see them right next to each other, kind of creating that little ridge or that little line between two different species, they actually are probably fighting against each other at night for that space on the reef. Cool. Thanks for showing us that example, Katie and Drew. Um, Katie, want to check in. How are you doing on air down there? Absolutely, Noel. Um, I have about 1,900 PSI, and I think my videographers are around the same as me got about a half a tank down here. We are at about 50 to 60 feet, so taking up a little bit of air, but we still got some time. Cool. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, so let's keep looking around on the reef uh, for any other creatures that we might see. I know on the students' in-class activity sheets, there are a couple of creatures that may be a little harder to find. So first, we've got a nurse shark here shown swimming over on the reef. Then we've got a southern stingray, which sometimes you see in the sand, and finally a hawksbill sea turtle. Well, right. we didn't see the hawksbill, but we definitely saw that green. Yeah, that was a good spot. So, Katie, can you tell us a bit more about any of the organisms you're seeing down there? 
Absolutely. I'm trying to see if we have any here that are on our in-class activity sheet. And I am seeing one small one. If you guys will swim with me this way, I think I actually saw a purple sea fan. It's a smaller one, but still counts. And a purple sea fan is one of the animals that's on their in-class activity sheet that you guys have in class right now. So this little guy here, although small, only about five inches or so, is a coral, just like all of the stony corals that you see around me. However, this particular coral, you see if I wave my hand over it, it sort of wafts from side to side a little bit. And that's because this is a soft coral, not necessarily a stony coral like these corals around me. It lacks that calcium carbonate skeleton that the other stony corals have and that we humans have. However, it does have a little bit of it, so it does remain slightly rigid. And it still has that zooxanthellae, or that photosynthetic algae that lives inside of the coral itself. So, it is related in that it has that symbiotic relationship between the zooxanthellae and the coral, but it doesn't necessarily stay in one spot just like the rest of the coral does. Cool, that was a beautiful sea fan, Katie. Thank you so much for finding that. Um, so we've got a couple more questions that we want to look at. Anthony from East End Primary School in year six wants to know about garbage in our oceans. So how does that actually affect the coral reefs? Oh, wow, Anthony, that's an awesome question. Garbage can affect our coral reefs in so many different ways. As you can see, this beautiful reef behind me is full of all kinds of colors, blues and reds and yellows and everything in between. And if we put too much pollution into our oceans, it can actually mean that there's a lot of algae growth. And an excess of algae in the oceans mean that there will be less corals in the oceans as well. So, pollution is definitely harmful for coral reefs. Direct littering or garbage on the reef is bad for it. And I actually happened to bring with me a plastic bag just for this very reason. Now, we happened to see a sea turtle earlier in the dive. And some sea turtles, guess what they eat? Let me just put this bag out for you. Imagine if you at home were a sea turtle and you stumbled across this plastic bag in the ocean. What does that kind of look like to everyone? If it moved a bit with the ocean like this, almost like a jellyfish. And those sea turtles, like a hawksbill turtle, would come along and eat that jellyfish and ingest it thinking that's what it was, not knowing it's a plastic bag. So garbage on the coral reef can actually poison or harm animals directly through them eating them. Or also, this plastic bag could get stuck on any of these corals or any of these sponges on the reef, blocking out the sunlight that those corals or sponges need to photosynthesize and get that energy from that algae. So there's quite a few reasons why garbage on the reef is pretty bad. Thanks, Katie. Anthony, that was a great question. Um, so Little Cayman Education Services had a question about um, black coral. So if we need to preserve corals, then why is black coral used for jewelry? Uh, that's a great question. I wonder who came up with that, if it was Jade or James, but that's a great question. Well, honestly, taking coral for jewelry is never a good idea. We really should not be taking anything out of the ocean that was growing there naturally, especially not coral, as believe it or not, we may get to a little bit later in our lesson, coral reefs serve so many positive purposes to us besides being jewelry. So really, nobody should be selling or purchasing corals for jewelry. Hopefully, if they are, 
It's because they were farmed in a nursery-grown or laboratory-grown setting. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. So I think we had one more question from Edna Moyle Primary School, Year 5. Charity wants to know just why are coral reefs so important for us? Noel, I'm sorry, one more second. I think our videographers are trying to tell me something here. Just want to make sure that everybody is doing okay. All right, no problem. Just let me know what they're saying. Okay. I think one of the videographers has found a sponge that they want us to look at. So they're going to go try to set that up down there so that we can get a, a sponge demonstration in later on. Can you repeat that question for me, Noelle? Yeah, no problem. Um, Charity was asking, she really wants to know just why coral reefs are so important for us as humans. Charity, awesome question. Coral reefs are important to us for so many reasons. Number one, look at the size of this coral reef behind me. From the sand, to the top is probably around 25 feet or so. So it's pretty large. And they are the first line of defense for us humans against storm damage. So when big hurricanes come in and they're pushing those really big waves onto the coastline, if you have a house on the coast or if you're on the coast, those waves could be really harmful to your home or to you. So that's one reason why they're super important. Another reason, I'm sure that we must have many fishermen and fisherwomen in the audience, and I like to fish myself. These coral reefs provide habitat for fishes that we like to eat, or that we need to eat to keep our food source. Another reason they're important. And then, another reason that reefs are important, which is a very new uh, area of research, is actually corals can be used for medicinal purposes. Researchers have actually found that stony corals, like we have on this reef behind me, are actually being looked into for cures for Alzheimer's and even cancer. Thanks, Katie. Those are all really important reasons for us to keep coral reefs around. Um, so one more benefit that I can think of is that sometimes the coral reefs help clean our oceans. Can you demonstrate to us how sponges maybe help keep our oceans clean? Absolutely, and I think that's what our um, divers are getting set up now. So let me swim down there to them as they found a yellow tube sponge, which is actually, I think, one of the animals that's on their in-class activity sheet. And we can see if we can get this demonstration set up while I explain how important sponges are to the ecosystem. So we've gotten a permit from the DOE to the Department of the Environment to use this non-toxic fluorescent dye called fluorescein that my dye buddy Celine is bringing to me. <laughs> Thank you, Celine. <laughs> <laughs> So you see here I have a, a syringe of fluorescein, and here we have a yellow tube sponge. Now the reason that sponges are important to the coral reef is because they're natural cleaners of our surrounding ocean. How they do that is, believe it or not, they're an animal, as I said a bit earlier, a very simple animal, but they're still an animal, and what they do is they have specialized cells in the wall of their spongy walls, or their squishy walls, called choanocytes. These choanocytes can actually pump water, creating a small water current, taking in the surrounding seawater, and pumping out the excess through the top of their chimney. In this process, they're taking in all the food that they need, which could also be pollutants to us humans or to other animals on the reef. So, it looks like Drew is all ready, so let's go ahead and give this a try. Again, this is a non-toxic dye that's not going to harm the sponge or the small fish that seems to be finding a home on top of it. 
I'm just going to inject a very small amount of it at the base of the sponge. And hopefully, it'll come out the top so you can see how the sponge actually takes in surrounding seawater and pumps it out through the top of its chimney. Now it could be that this one is not wanting to cooperate with us today. <laughs> Well, it looks like that little fish has made that sponge his home. <laughs> There's also some brittle sea stars that are inside the sponge as well. Oh, there we go. We've got a little bit. We've got a little bit coming out the top of this one. So what's wow. happening is that the sponge is taking in the surrounding seawater at the base and taking it inside the chimney. And as it pumps that seawater out, the top of it, it would be taking in any excess nutrients through the walls, through its coanocytes. So pretty cool. This one almost didn't work for us today because when we do this activity with students that come through CCMI, we have found that although this yellow tube sponge is usually pretty dependable, it doesn't always pump all the time as much as we like to show. That's a really cool demonstration, Katie. Thank you so much for showing us that. And good find by Drew and our camera crew over there. Absolutely. So, Katie, want to check in once again and see how you're doing on air? Yep. I have about 1,500 PSI, and it looks like my videographers are doing some excellent teamwork right now and actually switching out the buddies so that one of them can start their safety stop. And then our project manager, Tom, is actually going to start manning the other camera. So definitely a lot of teamwork going on down here around me. Absolutely, Katie. So it looks like we'll have a few more minutes left with our lesson then. Um, Katie, would you want to talk to us some about the threats that coral reefs are facing and what we can do to help them in the future? Absolutely. Why don't we go for another swim up to the top of the reef here so that we can take the spotlight off this sponge. And I can tell you guys a bit about some other threats to coral reefs that we have and how we can help. So, Katie, as you're swimming, um, let's talk about some of the creatures that maybe we might see um, that are on the students' worksheets. So I know some that we haven't quite seen yet are the Caribbean spiny lobster, a long-spined sea urchin, and a schoolmaster. So those are a couple of the other organisms that should be on the students' activity sheets. So hopefully we can keep our eyes out and maybe spot one or two of those along the way. All right, I'll keep my eye out down here as well. I don't think I've seen any of them, but our dive support team has been crucial so far at this dive and finding all the really cool stuff, so <laughs> maybe they'll point one out to me. <laughs> All right, well, while we're at the top of the reef, I can kind of talk a little bit about what you asked earlier, the threats to coral reefs today. Um, we had a student ask a question about garbage on the reef and, and plastic. So I won't get into that, but of course, pollution is definitely a threat to today's coral reefs. And some things that you students at home can do which are very simple things, are saying no to these single-use plastic bags, just getting a reusable bag at the store instead of taking these plastic ones. When you go out to a restaurant, just refusing a plastic straw or saying, no thanks, I don't need one. Very easy ways to reduce the garbage that goes into the oceans. Now, 
Another thing you can do is a threat to today's coral reefs is definitely overfishing. Unfortunately, many of us like to fish. However, we're not fishing very sustainably. So, if you look on the coral reef around me, out here in the blue, there are lots of smaller reef fishes. We haven't seen too many apex predators, like groupers or sharks or stingrays or eels. Now, that could just be because we're very noisy down here right now, <laughs> but it could also be due to overfishing. Very simple thing that all of us can do to prevent that from happening is follow your local fishing laws that are put out by your local environmental protection agency. Here in the Cayman Islands, the Department of Environment is really great about updating those laws and regulations. So all we have to do is just follow them and keep up with them to make sure that we're not breaking any laws while fishing because they're usually in place to ensure that those fish are going to be here in the sea for us to enjoy for many years to come. And another threat to coral reefs, we kind of talked about earlier a little bit, is climate change. Now, you may think at home that there's nothing that you guys can do to minimize your impact on climate change, but that's just not true. All of us can make a difference in minimizing our impact on the coral reef by doing some very simple practices at home every day. The less energy that we use, the more likely it will have an impact on our environment, including the coral reef. So when you leave a room, just turn the light off, turn the fan off, or even open the window to let in the breeze instead of using the air conditioning all the time. Not letting your water run while you're brushing your teeth. All of those very small things can make a really big impact. If all of us are doing it together, then it will make a difference. I totally agree with you, Katie. And as we're celebrating 2018 as the International Year of the Reef, small changes like just saying no to single-use plastics or making sure we're practicing safe fishing practices um, and even just turning off the lights can really make a big difference. So, one more time, how are you doing on air, Katie? Um, I've got about 1,100 PSI. So we have a few more minutes for questions and maybe some lessons before we have to do a safety stop and call the end of the dive. Yeah, I've got some questions coming in from students right now. Sure. So, um, Taryn B. from Red Bay Primary School wants to know if there are any laws that protect coral reefs. Any laws that protect coral reefs? Yes. There are actually quite a few laws that protect coral reefs. Um, throughout the world, a lot of government agencies and local nonprofits are making sure to create what are called marine protected areas. And actually, right here in Little Cayman, we have one of the most famous marine protected areas in the world, which is called Bloody Bay Marine Park. We're not diving in Bloody Bay Marine Park right now at this dive site, but it's only a few dive sites away. And those marine parks are actually putting laws in place that prevent things like fishing on those coral reefs. They prevent divers from going in certain times of the year, especially times of the year like right now, when there's a massive NASA grouper spawning irrigation happening. So protecting these really special times on the coral reef is really crucial to their futures. And people are doing it all across the world, and especially here in the Cayman Islands as well. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. So we'll do a couple more questions. Um, Davin, year six, wants to know if you know what Cayman's biggest coral reef is. <laughs> Gavin, that's a great question, and <laughs> that's actually one that kind of stumps me a little bit. Um, our biggest coral
coral reef. Well, the Cayman Islands is one of the most beautiful reefs in the Caribbean. And it was formed not too long ago. This reef is only about one to 3,000 years old here in the Caribbean. And the Caymans were formed because there was two plates, two tectonic plates, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate. And not only did they come together in what's called a convergence zone, but they also moved next to each other, called a transform fault. So they came together and moved to form what is called the Cayman Trench. And technically, all of the reefs along the Cayman Trench, including this one behind me, are part of the same coral reef system. So I don't know specifically which dive site is the largest, but all of the Cayman Islands on the Cayman Trench are pretty big. <laughs> Yeah, that was a tricky question. Thanks, Katie. Um, one more question. Josiah from Red Bay Primary School wants to know how coral reefs reproduce. Wow, Josiah, that's an awesome question. <laughs> Let me just check in with my dive buddy here, my videographer Evan, real quick. I think we definitely have time to answer this question. A question which I'm very impressed, I gotta say, that he asked. <laughs> So let's come over here, and I can show you this coral a little bit up close. Now, how most corals reproduce is really quite complicated. This particular coral is hermaphroditic, which means that it has both male and female gametes, so it has both sperm and egg, all inside one coral. And once a year, after a full moon, typically, in the warmer months, so like August, September, somewhere around there, each of these little individual coral-like cups, which houses that polyp we were talking about, will actually release a little bundle of the sperm and eggs all together out into the water column all at one time. They will then mix in the water column, eventually joining each other from the same species, forming a fertilized cell or a zygote. And within the first day or two, they'll start building that calcium carbonate structure, which causes them to get heavy and sink in the water column until they hit one of the open bare spots on this reef. And once they do, they start to bud forming one coral, or one coral egg cup, excuse me, next to each other, until it creates an entire colony that you see here. Another way that corals reproduce is by fragmentation. So if you have a branching coral, and one branch breaks off, and kind of rolls around in the ocean, and then establishes itself over here, it's still the same coral as this one, it's just rolled over here and become sort of a clone. So that's, through asexual fragmentation, another form of reproduction. So, as I said, great question. Oh, and it looks like, actually, our videographer Tom has found a southern stingray in the sand hunting with a bar jack. So this style of hunting is called nuclear hunting. Sorry to cut off your question, Josiah, but <laughs> we can always come back to it again. Now, if Tom got some of that footage, what's happening here is that southern stingray is kind of flying along the sand, getting any bivalves or crustaceans out of the sand, and then that bar jack is kind of hanging out right next to the little openings in the southern stingray's head, which are called spiracles. And any of the food that that southern stingray is taking in is getting pumped out of the spiracles behind it. And that bar jack is able to pick off all of the little excess pieces of food that the bar jack is pumping out through its spiracles. So 
That was a good, a good shout by our videographer Tom, who saw that. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much for that, Katie, and for answering all of these questions so far. But I think we need to start wrapping it up. Do you have anything else you'd like to say to the students before we log off? Yeah, unfortunately, I am getting a little low on air, so I think it is time to wrap it up. Um, I guess all I wanted to say is thank you guys so much for joining us on our first ever Reefs Go Live. I know it's been a, a long journey to get to this point, and we appreciate all the help and all the patience of all of the teachers and all of the students who are joining us today from all three of the Cayman Islands, Cayman Brack, Little Cayman, and Grand Cayman. We couldn't have done this without you guys, and we really appreciate it. And thank you students for being my dive buddy on our dive today to explore this beautiful coral reef. I hope that you all learned something that you can take away and teach somebody else, because really, we're doing this for you, because the future of our coral reefs is in your hands. So. I'm always here to answer any questions you may have, as well as any member of our team. But for now, we got to go. So I hope you guys will join us again on our next Reefs Go Live, which is honoring the herbivores. We'll let you know when we have a, a date and location for that. But until then, we'll see you around. So thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks so much, Katie. We'll see you topside in just a bit. All right, now for you students, we covered a lot of material today, and we hope that you learned some really valuable lessons, like what exactly is a coral reef and why they're just so important for us as humans. Um, we tried to answer as many of your questions as we could. You guys had a lot, and that's awesome. So here's what we'll do. Um, after we log off, we'll record Katie on the surface answering any of those questions that you may have, and we'll send them back to you at school so you can discuss them in your class. So if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and send those in now and make sure we'll make sure that Katie gets to them in a bit. So before we log off, I just want to say thank you from our whole Reefsco live team for joining us on our live lesson today. I know I had a blast, I hope that you guys did too and that you learned something really important. So please join us for our next Go Reefsco live entitled Honoring the Herbivores and we'll be sending out links and information for that very soon. Thanks again and we hope to see you underwater again with us soon. Hey Noel, can you hear me? Hey Casey Bonner.